Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show. And today I am getting to review my darling little Tudor Submariner. This is the reference 75090. I thought instead of doing the predictable duel and uh, witnessing its uh, inevitable um, slaughtering by my um, contemporary Rolex Submariner, the reference 11668. 10LN. I thought I'd do a comparative review, then I could focus more on the minutiae of the differences and similarities between them and still get to talk about the positives and negatives. Now, before I get into this review, I'll do a quick wristwatch check and I am wearing my gorgeous little 1945 pilot's watch from Amiga with those ravishing blued hands. Still puts a smile on my face every time I wear it. And I'm wearing this really because I'm going to be talking about the Amiga uh, later on this week in a very, very special unboxing. Um, so I thought I'd uh, pop it on. I'm still running impeccably well, I have to say. Anyway, uh, let's get on with the review. So I guess I should talk a little bit about the history of the Tudor Submariner. The first Tudor Submariner was in 1954. It was the reference 7922 with that um, stunning gilt dial, no date of course, and that was called the Submariner Oyster Prince. And the Submariners from Tudor have an astonishing 45 years of evolution, uh, culminating in 1999. Uh, then Tudor took a bit of a hiatus and returned with the contemporary Black Bays. Uh, but those technically are not um, Submariners, even though they are deeply, deeply rooted and inspired by the classic Submariners. Now, I have covered uh, the Submariner history quite extensively, so I'll just run through it very quickly now, as, as it is obviously relevant to today's watch. The first Tudor sub was only 100 meters water resistant, then became 200 meters with the reference 7924, which was released in 1958. Um, aesthetically, the most similar to the reference we're looking at today is probably um, the 7928 that was released in 1964. The rounded crown guards were introduced then and obviously the switch from uh, gilt to silver. These are extremely highly prized by collectors um, due mainly to their tropical dials caused by um, consistent uh, exposure to UV. What is interesting about the, the initial era of Tudor Submariners is that a lot of people mistakenly think that they were introduced based on the back of the success of its Rolex bigger brother. However, the very first Rolex Submariner and the Tudor Submariner were actually uh, developed at the same time. Uh, Tudor held back the release of the Tudor Submariner uh, to make way for its um, more expensive Rolex cousin or brother, however you want to uh, use the analogy. The ideology behind the Tudor to its founding principles was always there it being an affordable, rugged, precise choice for the professional. In 1969 saw the dawn of the second era of the Tudor Submariner. While the general foundations of the product were already laid by the 7900 series, its evolution continued and probably its most notable differentiation between um, its, its um, Rolex cousins. Here we saw the introduction of ETA self-winding movements, unique dials, square hour markers were introduced and the now famous snowflakes. The first of which was the reference 7016. There we saw the introduction of the navy colors, the navy blue color scheme that um, is a present in mind. The shield logo on the dial rather than the uh, previous Tudor rose. And if you're not familiar with Tudor, which you should be by now, the name um, is in honor of the British royal dynasty. Hans Wilsdorf was a big Anglophile. It was with the reference 7016 that the Tudor identity really became um, something of its own. These were 39 millimeter cases, again 200 meters water resistant with bi-directional rotating bezels. With the 7021 we saw uh, dates being added with that typical Cyclops plexiglass crystal. As the Tudor Submariner entered the 70s we saw perhaps its most prestigious era it being the choice of the US Navy SEALs with the reference 7928 
And in 1977, the 9401 with the snowflakes hands being the choice of the Marine Nationale. And these military divers are of course uh, the most sought after by collectors. There's no better proof of quality for a tool intended for professionals than the adoption by organizations that, well, the main activities push the use of the item to their ultimate limits. And these were both uh, elite personnel and thus extended the reputation of the Tudor submariners. We also saw quite an interesting release of a left-handed version in 1981 with the reference 94010. And then in 1989, we saw the release of the 79090, which is the reference of mine. This included a new flip lock folding clasp and a return to the more classic Mercedes hands. This ran all the way to 1995 with the final uh, Tudor Submariner, which is one I've owned previously, which is the reference 79190. Its most distinguishing feature is the steel bezel rather than the aluminium insert and the addition of applied markers. This particular reference was released in four different sizes. There was the ladies version, which was I think 32 millimeters. There's the mini sub, which is 34 millimeters, which I was also contemplating. Then there's the mid size in 36, and then the regular, uh, which I believe was 39 millimeters. And then here we are with my particular reference second from last, and um, I gotta admit, I was not intending to buy this. Uh, I just saw it and fell in love with the color. I described in my unboxing the, the blue reminding me of my mother's Volkswagen Beetle, uh, which was this beautiful kind of resplendent, unmistakable royal blue. I was also inspired in part by a post on the Urban Gentry Instagram. Guys, if you're not following, make sure you do and uh, all you have to do is to submit uh, just hashtag wristwatch check. And so I saw this post, where is it? There we go. By a gentry member, George, uh, traveling in Italy with his little Tudor there and uh, having, having an espresso and I just thought, oh my God, I want that <laughs> watch. Um, and I thought, you know what? It would be a nice way to, because I was even co contemplating getting it, uh, selling this to, to, to do some traveling and then later on buying a, a vintage Submariner. Um, however, I, as you guys know, I, I decided to keep this. Um, I'm not going to be able to travel for a little while yet until later next year because I, I have some uh, big um, events and, and, and jobs coming up in, the, in this year. So I thought, well, and also its sentimental attachment to me is so important. Um, it marked my 30th birthday and various adventures. So I decided, well, you know what? Why don't I get the next best thing? A little Tudor Submariner. Let's get the basic dimensions out of the way first. So the diameter is 36 millimeters. The height is only just a smidgen over 10 millimeters. Lug to lug is 44 millimeters. And then the lug width is 18 millimeters. It is the mid size in comparison. My sub, which is the most contemporary, is 40 millimeters in diameter, 12 millimeters thick, 48 millimeters from lug to lug, and then with a lug width of 20 millimeters. Now I have done numerous videos on my Rolex Submariner. Uh, so just in case you miss them, I'll quickly go through the specifications and compare it to my Tudor. So they're both stainless steel. They both share the famous oyster case. Uh, however, the Rolex is 904L stainless steel, which is more corrosive resistant. I think the quality of construction, uh, just from the general feel of it, is of a higher standard on the Rolex. Uh, but that's not really a surprise there. The finishing on the Tudor is exactly the same as the Rolex. Polished on the sides with a brushed finish on the top. The Tudor has an aluminium insert, whereas the Rolex has scratch resistant ceramic bezel insert. The Tudor has the tritium loom, which unfortunately has lost its charge. The Rolex has that fantastic chromolite, which is extremely bright and responsive. The Rolex is 300 meters water resistant with a triple lock crown, whereas the Tudor is 200 meters water resistant with a twin lock crown. They both share Mercedes hands. 
The Tudor has the ETA 2824-2. In terms of performance, it's running solidly with a respectable plus six uh, seconds every 24 hours. While the Rolex Submariner has their in-house 3135. The Rolex has 31 joules, while the ETA in the Tudor has 25 joules. They both operate at 28,800 vibrations an hour. They both have quick set, they both are hackable, they both have manual wind, and they are, of course, both automatic. However, the ETA has a 38, 40 hour power reserve, while the Rolex has 48 hours power reserve. The Rolex is also COSC certified, whereas the ETA isn't, although the ETA is a top grade and is nicely decorated. They're actually almost decorated to the same degree. However, the architecture is very different when it comes to the regulation and the balance wheel. The Rolex is far more reliable, generally known for more stability over time. The 3135 is also fitted with Rolex's parachrome hairspring, which has a great resistance to magnetism with a greater resistance to shock. They both do have sapphire glass, uh, which is something they share. The Tudor comes on perhaps one of the most flimsiest Jubilee bracelets that is just so indicative of the 80s. Uh, you can see the folded links there, hollow end links. Um, it is extremely fluid and jingly jangly and, and, and there's a lot of stretch. Um, personally, I absolutely adore it, but you know, I'm an 80s baby. Uh, so polished center links uh, brushed on the sides. And of course, the contemporary Rolex has the Oyster bracelet uh, with solid end links. And in my opinion, I've done a whole video just about the Glidelock clasp, which is one of the best, um, I think, clasps and, and bracelets in the business. Uh, you just pop it down and you can adjust it on the fly like that. I mean, it's just absolute genius and very easy to adjust uh, and you can get a perfect fit. There's no diver extension on the Tudor. Uh, there's tons of micro uh, adjustments though and that little fold over flip lock. Very rudimentary by today's standards. So this is from 1992, whereas my uh, Rolex is from 2011. Also, I must point out, as I've said a million times before, the Rolex has a 120 click ratcheted bezel that is unidirectional. And in my opinion, I've never experienced a bezel as good. Uh, the Tudor has a quite bizarre uh, bidirectional bezel uh, that has no ratcheting whatsoever. And I've got to admit, when I unboxed it, I thought, oh my God, I thought it was broken. But um, I did confirm online that it's actually uh, normal. The dial is also dramatically quite different. Uh, we see the white gold applied markers, not only to give a nice luster, but actually to um, prevent tarnishing over time. And I think beautifully illustrates just the uh, level of, t of attention to detail that has gone into a modern sub. Of course, we have the rehort. I must say the, uh, the markings on the ceramic bezel are also engraved with, I think, platinum deposited inside of it. Uh, here we see just your standard aluminium insert with printed markers, the tritium inside of it. The minute track is also a little bit longer than your contemporary Rolex. Branding and naming is positioned exactly the same, although obviously on the Rolex we have the added superlative chronometer officially certified as well. Unfortunately, the Tudor cannot boast that achievement. The blue of the Tudor is quite dazzling. Sometimes it appears black in low light, and I think it complements the royal blue of the bezel insert beautifully. We do get a loom pip at the 12, although that has also lost its luminescent charge. So uh, let's pop it on the wrist and see how this bad boy wears. Several moments of pure class later. And there we go. So for my six and a quarter inch wrist, it fits wonderfully. I could have probably even got away with uh, the mini sub, which is 34 millimeters. Although I am a firm believer that divers should be not too small, because obviously they're legibility, uh, even though, you know, due to my, <laughs> my, uh, my lung condition, I, I will never be able to dive again. But 
Divers still make a great everyday watch. It wears extremely thin, almost like a, it's quite a dressy, elegant piece. I love the jingly jangly uh, bracelet, extremely comfortable. Um, although, um, you, I'm not sure if you can hear that, it does uh, have a bit of a tinny sound to it. Uh, the weight is 86 grams on the bracelet and 46 grams on a NATO strap. Interestingly, the Rolex is 154 grams on a bracelet and 92 grams uh, on a NATO, still heavier uh, <laughs> on a NATO strap than this is on a bracelet, quite interesting. In comparison, the Sub has a much larger presence, wears very much like a 42 millimeter diameter watch, a more shapely statuesque, greatly accentuated by the larger case, uh, mainly due to those um, massive shoulders. It also has a bit of a louder presence, the way it plays with the light, with the markers, and the kind of reflective quality of the ceramic insert as well. However, I've got to say it's a completely new experience wearing it on the NATO strap. Uh, I always wear it on a bracelet on the uh, Oyster clasp just because I love it so much. There is a reassuring feeling that the Rolex has, mainly due to its very solid feeling it gives. So anyway, let's take it off the wrist and summarize the watch. Let's start with the positives first. Despite it being inferior in almost every single way, I do love it and enjoy it more than my Submariner from Rolex. It has the history, it has the prestige. Okay, it might not have the X factor and movie stardom that the Rolex has, but it has that charm. I love the fact that it's aged already. It's got, you know, little dinks and scratches, but it's not over polished. I was very lucky to find this at a reasonable price. You do get that Rolex feeling without it being a ripoff. Tudor for a long time was considered the poor man's Rolex, as now I think it's seen with a bit more respect. The Jubilee is of course dated, uh, but I, I find it very charming. And there is even the Rolex symbol on the crown. And I got asked during the unboxing, why is that? Well, in the early days, parts were often shared between the brands. The biggest advantage for me of this piece is knowing that it's going to be a lot less expensive to maintain over its cousin or brother or however you want to uh, call it. I recently serviced an ETA based Tudor and it was just over $200. There's also a ton of parts. Uh, it's a lot easier to, to source the parts. My specialist Saltzmans, they were able to find a crystal replacement for a pre-sapphire piece uh, using their connections. So it's less of a worry. I have to take the uh, Rolex in for a service in, I think, 2021, and it's going to cost, you know, a ruddy fortune. But I'm prepared to pay that because I know that's the, the cost of owning these things. It just gives me peace of mind knowing that I can service the, the Tudor whenever I want quite affordably. The third thing I love about the Tudor is its size. I love the fact that there are more options. Uh, you know, you get a choice of four different sizes as I've explained before. And I know I bang on about sizes being smaller or my preference for smaller sizes, but guys, you gotta understand that size is all about relativity to your wrist. Uh, it's got to be proportional to the wearer. If you like big watches and they suit your wrist, that's absolutely fine. I'm not knocking it whatsoever. For me, wearing a massive watch, even the Rolex here is pushing it. And you've got to remember, guys, that I bought my Rolex Submariner uh, before my long battle with health, uh, where, where I lost a lot of weight. Um, and um, actually, even before then, I, I wasn't as into fitness. So I was just a bigger chap generally, and, and it suited me a lot better back then. Um, but because I've had it so long and, and the sentimental attachment, and I, you know, I still love it and enjoy it. Had I been in the market for a Submarine these days, I probably wouldn't have gone for it. But I gotta say, the size of this is absolute perfection. My fourth major positive is the color blue. I love blue dials. I mean, you guys know that from my Navi timer, my Squally 1521, the Nakin, and now this. It's a blue I haven't experienced before. It's not like the Seamaster blue. It's not like the Azzurro of the Squally. It's it's very much its own thing. It's, it's quite a subtle blue, and 
remarkably versatile when it comes to pairing with straps. I mean, it really is a pleasure to play with the color. It looks great on so many. I mean, this is an unabashed strap monster and it even has the holes in the case. So it's just switching it out is a doddle. It looks great on vintage straps. Uh, a lot more, I have to say, than the Rolex. The Rolex is so modern, so so contemporary. Um, and it's funny because it's it's monochromatic. Usually the monochromatic watches are the more compatible. And the fifth last big positive here is it's less ubiquitous. It's a more low key, I feel, than the Rolex. Uh, also, I love the little nod to history or British history, which of course appeals to my own roots. I feel very much like it's its own thing and I appreciate it for that. It's, it's a less obvious choice. I think you'll you'll get the respect from the connoisseurs. Downside is, of course, you'll always get that question. Oh, is that a Rolex? And then, if they're not a watch person, you have to explain. And it's uh, I I just simply say yeah yeah it is. You anyway, know I can already hear a, a million knickers getting in a twist from that from that statement. But you know, guys, they're just watches, so take it easy. But the history's there. We've got 45 years of evolution. And I think this vintage piece really complements my modern Submariner beautifully. In fact, one day I'll probably get a third Submariner just to complete it with the no date. So let's talk about the negatives. Well, the first big negative is the lack of loom for me. I've said in previous videos how I like to wake up, but uh, you know, I have this strange habit of waking up four in the morning, checking the time and then going back to sleep. I can't do that with this. The second negative is, well, it's two and a half grand for what is essentially an ETA. That will always, uh, you know, factor into it. Uh, is it worth its value? Well, it's gonna keep its value. You've got a bit of that Rolex uh, tradability, but also bear in mind that the Rolex is four times the cost over what I paid for my Tudor. Unfortunately, this is not as sought after by collectors, but I think with the return to smaller sizes, it will do not as well as the Rolex here, but it will do well. Thirdly, the performance. You're not getting the rugged, dependable um, robustness of the Rolex. I have to be a little bit more careful. I'm more conscious about using it. It comes with the limitations of a vintage watch, uh, scratching the bezel, etc. I'm not gonna jump into a pool. Whereas this, you know, I, I, I've taken it on so many adventures. I've bashed it about and I know it's gonna take it. This is ironically, you know, even though it was not intended to be, is a little bit more delicate. My fourth, Big negative is the bi-directional bezel. Now I've had this in numerous uh, vintage watches before. Uh, this is nothing new to me. However, sometimes it, it does move by its own volition. I love a unidirectional ratcheted bezel. The resistance is adequate, but um, yeah, I, I just can't get used to a bi-directional bezel. My last negative is the absence of the rose. Um, that's what I really did like about that first generation of the Black Bay, uh, that they had the rose. Um, there is no roses here. Is there a rose on the back? No, we've even got the Rolex crown and the, uh, the case back. I wish it did have the rose, but of course it would have had to be a lot earlier reference and I would be paying through the nose, absolutely. So in conclusion, I have to say, it's still the, the absolute kippers and knickers for me. It really is. It's definitely the best Tudor I've ever owned. Um, I don't intend on selling it. I still haven't got bored of it. I think this is my final Tudor for me. I'm gonna enjoy watching the, the Tritium Patina. I really want to, to, this to be a keeper. If I had to choose between the two, as shocking as this sounds, I'd probably choose the Tudor. Yes, the Rolex is better in every single way imaginable and possible, but it doesn't have that feeling. A very similitude that is always present, I find, with vintage watches. It's not a reissue, it's the real deal. I think as collectors, our tastes evolve. Uh, I have actually physically changed as well. My, my scale and taste is different now. And as I've learned more about watches, I've come to appreciate Tudor more as well. And despite all its drawbacks, I'm willing to overlook it because the feeling it evokes. And that is what it's all about, guys. I think that proves the point. Whereas if I dueled these two watches, the Rolex would undoubtedly win. Of course it will win. 
It's a bit like comparing an M60 pattern tank uh, with the modern equivalent that replaced it, the M1 Abrams. It doesn't hold a chance compared to the modern technology. It's a better watch in every single way, but the Tudor speaks to me. And that's, I think, highlights a very profound and important point that at the end of the day, it's about emotion. It's about how the watch makes you feel. I love this watch. I mean, I love both of them, but I love this one a little bit more. It's the absolute business. I know you're probably rolling your eyes and you're gonna say, oh, you're gonna sell it in a couple of months. No, this is, this is gonna be a keeper for me. This is my last Tudor. The very last, <laughs> the last of the Tudors. That's about it. I'm going to leave it there. Let me know what your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions. Um, what is your favourite uh, Submariner? Um, doesn't have to be out of these two. What's your favourite reference? Uh, please do share in the comments. I'd love to hear back. And also uh, how watches have changed for you over the years. How, how have your tastes changed? Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.